I'd like to, first of all, thank Robert for uh, offering to speak to our group. He took the initiative and he contacted us through Meetup. So I'm thankful for that. And by coincidence, I did not have a speaker for April. So I was very happy to uh, hear from you. And um, I just want to introduce Robert. I hope I got your family name. You know, I'm going to mangle it. <laughs> but it's, it's like getting back to, you know, I get mangled all the time. So, <laughs> so you know, Bedingheimer. Bodigheimer. Bodigheimer. Yes. Robert Bodigheimer. So uh, when, while chatting before the uh, we started, he told me that he's from Minnesota because I looked at the clock on his computer and it's like eight o'clock, almost eight o'clock there. He's from Minnesota. And if you're interested in the geography, it borders on Ontario and Winnipeg. So he, ha he said he's been to Vancouver. He works for Schwann's Home Delivery, providing business solutions with web technologies. He's also a Microsoft MVP, a progress ninja with Fiddler, right? An ASP Insider. By the way, an ASP Insider is quite an honor to be an ASP Insider, because there aren't a lot of people who have that honor. And he's a plural site owner and a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. So uh, Robert regularly speaks at national and international events. And today, the topic he's delivering to us is making the web faster. So the floor is all yours, Robert. All right, thank you, thank you very much. You're welcome. So I'll skip over most of the ab about me because we covered that. Uh, that's my Twitter. Uh, that's my email and my blog information. So if you do want to reach out after the talk, I do have the slides and I have two versions of this uh, web page I'm going to go over. I have a before and after just to show you uh, the before is before I did really anything. I just took, made a standard bootstrap page, put it out. So like I said, I'm going to um, provide for you the slides and the code before and after. And again, the after, I haven't done every technique I'm gonna talk about, but I have a lot of them. And if you have questions during the talk, you can put them in the chat and we'll try to cover them as we go. And otherwise we'll hit them at the end as well. So for performance rules, so I've been doing programming for a really long time. I worked on compilers for a while. So when I first started working on web performance, I just assumed it would be, so I'm an ASP.NET developer. I assumed it would be C-sharp code and backend stuff I would need to tweak. Around the time when I was looking at this, Steve Soders did a great book on web performance. And one of the things he stressed that is for most websites, 80 to 90% of the time is spent waiting for page resources. So JavaScript, images, CSS. So that really changed my outlook on how I was going to approach performance. So it's typically not optimizing uh, server-side or backend code for APIs and such. I'll show you how you can tell. It's possible that you have a slow backend, but if you're like most websites, it's all the other things you're downloading that we need to worry about. So for performance rules, um, the first rule is make fewer requests. So we don't wanna make requests we don't need. But in the past, in the HTTP 1.1 world, we would purposely do things like bundling and things I'll talk about during the talk. Now that HTTP 2 is out, I put this in italics, meaning that it's less important to use those kinds of techniques, but obviously still don't request stuff you don't need uh, for your web page. You wanna send as little as possible and you wanna send it as infrequently as possible. So when we talk about techniques later, those will play back into these rules. I'm gonna show you Fiddler. So Fiddler is a tracing tool that was built specifically for HTTPS. Uh, it was made by Eric Lawrence and he was working at Microsoft. I always find it amazing. He didn't know HTTP, he didn't know C Sharp, he didn't know .NET. <clears throat> he just decided he was gonna write Fiddler on the weekends and give it to everybody for free. So I always find that amazing. I use it all the time. It was acquired by Telerik in 2012. 
I gave you a link here to where you can get it. I'm going to use it throughout the talk, so I'm going to do a quick demo with it here to start. I also wanted to point out they're working on Fiddler Everywhere, which is a cross-platform version of Fiddler. So it'll be available on Mac, it is now on Mac, and Linux in addition to Windows. So I'm going to show you Fiddler Classic here. And I just want to show you the before and after website. So let's pull up the before and after. So I've got a fictional travel web page here. Pretty standard. I'm not a designer, so I just use Bootstrap. Gave it a kind of basic look. So that is the before version. And if I were to pull up Fiddler, I use Fiddler whenever I'm going to review somebody's website because I can come in here very quickly. I know the techniques that I'm looking for and I can just jump around and see, is it doing what I would expect? The first thing I wanna show you is the statistics. So if you know average web pages today, it's usually about 75 requests. So I like to show this to new web developers just because, and marketing folks, they think one web page is one request and it's absolutely not, right? We know all the JavaScript, CSS images that go into that one request. So you can see it's a lot less requests than typical, but it's about three meg, and that's a pretty typical web page. We'll go look at what my after page looks like. And the idea with the after is it should visually look the same. So if you just scroll down, you wouldn't notice that I had done anything until you look at the Fiddler version. And if we look at this, we can see that we got down to 383K. So we dropped from, almost three meg down to 383. So if you look back, you can see some images that were almost that big for single images. We've gotten that entire page down to be that size. So that's the motivation for the talk is just that huge reduction in size. And I'm gonna also show you what that does to the user experience. But again, I just wanted you to see Fiddler because I'm gonna use it throughout the talk. When you look at performance, it's important to choose your metrics. So the first byte is a good IT backend metric. So when we look at um, web page tests and some of the other tools, you'll see first byte. If your first byte is three seconds, you do have a backend problem, right? The first byte is how long it took the browser to get to you, the web server, execute and send back the very first byte to the client. So you do wanna spot check that again, that's not typically the bottleneck in most web uh, sites today, but you can keep an eye on it. There are literally a ton of metrics. I've been using speed index. So uh, web page test is a tool I'm gonna show you came up with this a few years ago. It's basically the amount of time it takes for the main content in your viewport to display. So it's a good measure of a customer experience. Uh, there's also timed interactive, really old metrics, the onload and fully loaded. And then if you look at the bottom, uh, Chrome just introduced core web vitals. And that's becoming important because Google's going to use these for their search rankings soon. But they basically said there's three important things web pages should care about. The largest contentful paint, which is just the main content in your viewport. How long does it take before most of that is there? The first input delay is once the page is visible, how long is it before the um, customer can actually click and interact with the page. And then lastly, <clears throat> the cumulative layout shift. If you've been to a lot of web pages that move around, so when they're painting things constantly shifting, that's not a good experience either. So all three of those things get rolled into core web vitals. So the important thing is choose a few metrics, uh, have a good way to measure. We're gonna talk about measurement next. But before I do any performance improvements, I like to get the current measurements and then do the improvement, immediately do the after, just so I can keep a history of things we've done on our website and how it's helped performance. We'll talk about measuring. Uh, so I'm gonna show you webpagetest.org. This is another great free tool. So they have computers, phones all over the world where you can do testing from for free. So you can point it at your website and I'll show you what that looks like for the before site. So if I came out here, I can just go to web page test. Um, they partnered recently, so they've been doing a lot of improvements lately, but I can just punch in a URL here and say, start a test. 
So I actually deployed my before and after out to Azure so that they were accessible on the internet and I ran the before and after report. Usually it takes a minute or so to run and I just wanted to save some time. So you can see my before version. Here are all the metrics we were talking about. So I can see that the speed index was about 5.4 seconds. So that's about how long it was before the page is mostly visible. You can see the core vitals here. So I was doing not so great on layout shift. Uh, the blocking time's not too bad. Again, they gave me some scores up top here that I can look at. But what I find most interesting in here, I can actually go look at, it keeps a video. I like showing the video to marketing people. Uh, just to convince them of what the user experience. I can tell them it's 20% faster. Showing them visuals uh, is a big difference. So this is what my before looked like. You know, completely blank. It slowly starts to paint. Stuff's going to shift around. So it took about six seconds before the user's going to think that basically my page was there. The other thing I like to look at is the waterfall. So if you've seen waterfall views before, it's similar to Fiddler here with the request. So I requested the HTML page and it breaks it down into DNS lookup, connection time, et cetera. Then you can see the JavaScript. So it's similar, Fiddler has this tool in their timeline, but I can visually see which portions took certain periods of time. So I can quickly look at this and say, I know that some of my JPEGs are awfully big because it takes a long time from 1.5 seconds out to about 5.5 for those to be completely downloaded. I can also look at the connection view. So by coming down to the connection view, I can immediately tell that this is using HTTP 1.1 because in those days, browsers would use six connections per host. But the bad news is every connection, you can see it needs to spin up that connection time. Uh, so I'll show you some of the improvements we made in the after version, but Again, I can come in and spot check and see what's taking time. It's got all of the metrics here. So I can see, you know, with this given metric, the layout shift happened here. I can see where speed index was about out here, right, 5.5. So I could guess that this bootstrap.css is probably a big component in why it took so long to get that uh, speed index. So again, if I look at the after version, you can see scored all A's across. I've got it hosted on a VM. It looks like I need to do a little security work there. But my metrics have improved across the board. I'm all green on web vitals and my speed index went from about six seconds down to about one. So again, if I pop in the video, if you remember what the experience was before, straight up a second, it was six seconds. So I've cut roughly five seconds off the time and it painted immediately without any layout shifts. So that's a huge improvement. And if I look at the waterfall again, I can see I've got some connection time. Remember these things look like they're long, but that's all of this happens still in a second compared to six. The other thing you'll notice is that all of these things are happening in parallel. So we'll talk about HTTP2 and why that matters. And why it matters is it all, it uses a single connection. So it's downloading all this stuff in parallel rather than doing it six at a time. So that's another big improvement. Nice thing is these are kept out here forever. So these web page tests, you can literally just copy this. So again, before I do a performance, I run it, I save this off, I do all my improvements, I run it again, and then I have this video history. So if someone says, why did you do whatever you did last year? I can go show them, well, we went from six seconds to one and look at the the video to see that experience. So that's a big benefit. The other thing with measuring, there's two types of measurements. One is called synthetic. Um, so we actually pay a service to watch our couple of our pages on our site from various cities in the United States um, every hour. So essentially these same computers, same ISPs, same places hit every hour. I like that because if I make a change today, I know that the measurements will be apples to apples, right? We're going from the same places, same speed computers. So I can compare and say it's this much faster. We also started uh, recently using real user monitoring or RUM. Uh, browsers started implementing these two standards below where they measure everything from the browser, like how long it did every image take, the DNS, the connection time. 
they report all that back. And in real user monitoring, then I can see individual customers. So I can go look at if a customer complained on a survey, I could go find their actual session and I could see why were they slow? <clears throat> was one of the images slow? Was a third party slow? So that combination of both of those things is important for your website to be able to do that kind of tracking and, and see how you're doing improvements. Is it good enough? Um, it's good to know if website performance impacts your goals as a website. So both Amazon and Walmart did an A-B test and they took uh, one group and they intentionally slowed them by a hundred milliseconds. So a 10th of a second. And coincidentally, both of them found that they lost 1% of their sales. So think about that. Uh, a 10th of a second slower, they lost 1% of their sales. Um, <clears throat> I would love to do this for my website do this A-B test because if I could get that kind of measurement for my site, every discussion about performance gets easier. Every time a designer says they want a new font, I could measure how long it takes to download that font. And then I would be able to say, if I were Amazon, I could say that font took 150 milliseconds. You're probably going to lose about one and a half percent of your sales. Is that font worth it? Maybe, right? Maybe for your brand. Um, but the discussion's a lot easier when you have those kind of metrics. So it's good to know that. It's also good to know just how you compare with your competitors. So there's another vendor called Speed Curve. If you want to check them out, they have nice. So I'm doing a comparison of slow retail sites. And I can come out here and look at major retailers and how I compare. So if I looked at mine and I'm in the second range, you could see that I'm doing much better than all of these people um, on mobile. And I can look at fast connections and stuff, but it's just nice to come out and compare yourself so you know how you stack up against other major competitors in your particular area. So that's kind of the background, the metrics. Again, you want to measure. I'm going to start jumping into specific techniques uh, because we all use different frameworks, uh, different web servers. And because we've got an hour, I'm not going to show you how to configure all these things. I'm more interested that you understand um, what the techni technique is, and then you can find out how to enable it for yourself. So the first one I'm going to look at, and I kind of stack them in the order of Definitely do, easy to do, quick wins. Um, I'll say that it's always important for any of these things you wanna try, turn them on and measure, right? See if it's better or not for you. Um, but compression, what it does, if you've used zip before, it's basically taking your file and just making it smaller. So if you take CSS files, JavaScript files, any of the text-based files, you generally can get anywhere from 50 to 80% smaller by turning on compression. Um, so we talked about I'm in Minnesota, uh, my full-time job, I work on an e-commerce website, we're in rural Minnesota, and we ran into bandwidth problems where we were growing fast enough that we could not get enough bandwidth into our building. So we actually looked at compression from a bandwidth standpoint. We went into IIS and said, please compress your static and your dynamic ASP.NET pages. The next day we cut our bandwidth in more than half. So literally just set a setting used half of our bandwidth. So it saved us a lot of money. We didn't have to pay for that bandwidth. We also saw it was about 25% faster for our synthetic measurements. So another quick, easy win. I'll show you what that looks like in Fiddler. So I'm just going to clear that. I will pull up our after site again. I'm going to hit Control F5 to make sure it gets requested. And if we look at this bootstrap, we can see it's about 36K. And if you come into inspectors, it'll tell you here that it, it's using compression and it used gzip compression. If I didn't compress, that would have been about 160K. So just turning on compression, we went from 160 down to 36. So again, a huge reduction, saves me bandwidth, saves download time for my customers. Um, very good idea for people to do. Next one is content expirations. So the idea with this is if you came to my website today, you're gonna to get my ASP.NET page, get all of my HTML. You can download all my images, all my JavaScript and all my CSS. And it's gonna store it in your browser cache. 
<clears throat> if you were to come back to my site tomorrow, I want you to come back for my ASP.NET page because things might have changed. But when that HTML comes back, if it turns out I haven't changed anything else, I would love to use what's sitting in your browser cache, right? It's never gonna get faster for you than pull it right off your own machine. It saves me bandwidth, it saves me server load. By default, if I don't tell browsers a specific content expiration, they have to guess. So if you've ever done a fiddler trace and you see the client sends an if modified sense and you see a 304 response, you basically left it to the browser and the browser said, yeah, I have this CSS file sitting right here on the machine, but maybe it's changed. I'm gonna go back to the server and check. That trip um, with latency could be just as bad as file downloads if the files are pretty small. So the idea with expirations, I'll show you where you can see this in Fiddler. I literally said I want my images and CSS, or I'm sorry, my CSS and my JavaScript to be cached for a year. And I want my <clears throat> images to be cached for 30 days. By specifically telling the browser this, the browser won't come back and ask if they've been changed. So I'm in complete control. Um, browsers will all consistently follow those rules. If it turns out that I needed to change this carousel file for tomorrow, all I need to do is change the URL somehow. I could add a version number to it. I could add a query string with a V equal two for version number two. I could use hashing. Anything that changes the URL, so the browser looks and says, I don't have that specific URL in my cache. It'll come back to my server. So I get the best of all worlds. If it hasn't been changed, it'll pull it right out of your cache. If it has been changed, you'll come and get the fresh content. Okay, so again, that's a, a big improvement uh, and reduction again, just by telling the browsers not to come back and ask for things. The next one that's usually a, a good win is a content delivery network. So I find it interesting. Um, people are doing the web for a long time. Finally, two, I think it was, engineers were, were at a bar. They were having an argument. Uh, does bandwidth matter more or does latency matter more? So if you know, every time you go to an ISP, <clears throat> they're constantly selling you 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second. What's usually really matters is latency. So latency is how long it takes your browser to talk to the server and get an answer back. So the further you are away, you know, speed of light and everything else, you have a higher latency. So they ran, you can go out and read the article. They ran where they made the bandwidth. They made it, you know, twice as good versus make the latency smaller. And for a while, the bandwidth is better. As you get more bandwidth, again, typical websites, we're not talking Netflix, normal, you know, business websites. It'll get better for a while and then it really plateaus. You could get a whole bunch more bandwidth and it's not gonna help you. But if you make your latency better, it steps every time. So if you, the idea is you wanna cut latency. So one of the ways to do that is I can't make the speed of light faster, but I can get my content closer to you. So you're in Vancouver, I'm in Minnesota. Uh, I pay a CDN and they have a network of servers all around the US for me uh, or all around the world that are closer to you than my data center. So I'm gonna show you how I do this. But again, we've been using a CDN for 15, 20 years. We host all of our images, CSS, JavaScript, our fonts. We put them all on our CDN. And I'll show you how you code that. So if you're familiar, if I had an image, normally I would just reference it like this. When I go to a CDN, let's say my domain was example.com, most of them will give me a, a subdomain like cdn.example.com. So I just have to change my reference to reference that name. I happen to be using a protocol you protocol less URLs, if you've never seen that, it uses whatever the page used. Nowadays, all I use is HTTPS, so I could specify that, but I can also do this. When a browser visits my site, the trick is cdnexample.com goes to DNS. The CDN finds the closest server to you. So hopefully there's a CDN server in Vancouver. It will actually give you back the IP address of that server in Vancouver. So the first one of you that jumps out to my website tonight, um, maybe it won't be cached. 
that CDN server will come back to Minnesota, get all the images, CSS and JavaScript, then it will follow my caching rules and it will cache a copy of all of them in Vancouver. Now the rest of you that are hitting the site after that will pull all the files from a server in Vancouver instead of having to wait for it to go to um, Minnesota. So especially you know, cross oceans, uh, US, Australia, uh, US and Europe, it's a huge improvement to be able to use CDNs that are closer to your customer. And there's so many of them these days. Uh, they're so cheap as well. It's just a great way to offload a lot of work from your servers um, and be able to speed it up for your customers. Next step is bundling and minification. So I'm gonna show you minification first. And the idea with minification is you take your CSS and your JavaScript and you strip out all the white space, the semicolons, all that stuff. So I'm gonna show you before and after here. Let's look at the JavaScript. So if you've never seen this, this is the normal bootstrap JavaScript file, right? It's what you would expect. If you look at the minified version, it essentially is going to take out all that white space. So that's great from a size standpoint. So this is 59K. If we go back to the before version of the same thing, it's 134K. So a very good reduction in size, um, just because you're getting rid of comments, white space, all the stuff that you don't need. Um, in, if you need to troubleshoot, so if you say that's great, but I'm troubleshooting on the client, uh, dev tools have a pretty print feature. So you can actually show, uh, it'll have spacing again. It won't be the original names, but you'll be able to troubleshoot. And you can also use source maps. So we use source maps in production that map the minified files back to the original JavaScript file. So I can open up dev tools and, and walk through my normal JavaScript, even though it was served minified. So that's cool. <clears throat> in the HTTP 1.1 days, I was saying there's only six connections per host. So we took all of our JavaScript files, minified them, and then combined them into a single JavaScript file. And we did that because that used those six connections wisely. And so the day we did this, we cut our homepage time in half. So we used some simple tools, um, Grunt, Gulp, Webpack, whatever you want to use for doing your builds. Um, there's ways to minify and build that in. Uh, we'll talk about why I'm moving away from bundling now. Um, but the minification is something you still want to do. You can do it for HTML. I'll give you two warnings. I have not found a good tool to do it on the fly for my ASP.NET pages. And also sometimes it does change your layout. So it can affect how your page looks. So I don't do HTML. I know that people do. So it might be something you want to look into. One of the biggest areas uh, for web pages for size is misusing images. So the first one was I've been, like I said, I've been doing web forever. Uh, when you used to want to do gradients, you know, where you have like red slowly go to white, that wasn't something you could do. You'd have to make an image that had that. Or years ago, if you wanted to use a specific font that wasn't one of the web safe fonts, we would typically use the font we wanted, put the text in, and then capture an image of that. So both of those cases where we were using images for things that we really didn't want to use images for, but we didn't have a choice. Now we have CSS3, we can do gradients, we can do web fonts. Um, so if you don't need to use images and you can get by with doing stuff in CSS, uh, do it in CSS. If you need to use images, make sure you pick the proper type. Um, so if you're doing logos today, you really want to use SVG. Um, we're going to talk about responsive design. Most websites today use responsive design techniques, so they work on a phone, a tablet, and a desktop. SVGs are mathematical instead of being bitmapped. So as you get bigger and bigger sizes, it just recalculates the logo. It doesn't have to have a bigger sized file. So again, logos look into SVGs. If you're doing photos, you're going to want to use JPEGs. Um, again, people will argue this with me. So usually the best way to solve arguments is show them, right? Say, well, let's look at this. So I went to Sydney and you can actually walk up the Sydney Harbor Bridge. And so I found out my dad was afraid of heights that day. Probably should have asked him before I signed him up, but 
Anyways, this is a PNG. So some people say you can do PNGs for photos. Well, you can. That's about 516K. The corresponding JPEG that's the same size looks just as good. But if I look at the size, it's 56K. That's about 10 times larger to use a PNG. So if in doubt, save it in the format you think and compare them, right? Every time I do this, the PNG loses because I can optimize JPEGs and I'll show you how to do that. There are some new types coming, AVIF, and I didn't list it here, but JPEG XL is another one that have some real promise for um, making sizes smaller. So if you didn't know this, you can come out to a place called Can I Use, and you can punch in AVIF and it'll show me current browser support. So my problem is even though AVIF might make smaller images, it's not all that well supported, right? I'm an e-commerce site, I have to support. Thankfully, I got rid of IE 11 and less, but Edge, Safari, all of that. So this is not great support. I can do polyfills and stuff. It's just, it hasn't been worth it to me yet. The other one that's really exciting is JPEG XL is gonna make huge reductions in sizes, but unfortunately it's all red. There's not a browser today that supports it natively. So I'm watching both of those and you should too. Um, and WebP, they're all options. Uh, for now, I'm gonna focus on JPEGs and I'll show you again why. The other thing I'll mention, we talked about responsive. So years ago when responsive design just started, the problem is you have wanted to target a phone, a tablet and a PC or desktop. We just had the lowly image tag, right? Image source equals, well, I need to be have it look good on a desktop. So people would use a source that was for the biggest image they had. Well, that gave a bad knock to responsive because on a phone, you were downloading absolutely huge images. Well, um, a bunch of community members came together and said, let's do this better. And they pushed through a source set and a picture and got browser vendors to adopt that. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like if you haven't seen it. Um, ignore the data dash for a moment. But what I do is I create images of various sizes and I like to put the width right in the file name so I can see in log files what people are actually requesting. Then I just tell the browser, look, I have an image, here's source set, here are all the sizes, you pick the best one. So it's gonna look at uh, device pixel, you know, what's the pixel ratio, what's the size for the design that I need to display, all of that stuff gets taken into account. So I'm going to show you why we do this. Again, if I look at the images, that bridge walk, the 128 width is only 2K, the 2048 is 187K, that's almost, again, 100 times larger. So if I can pick this, and the design or the device only needs 128 for the width, that's a huge win again. So this is something we couldn't do years ago that we can do now. So I encourage you, make sure you're getting the right image for the right device by using techniques like this. In the future, client hints are gonna be another alternative where clients will send data to the server saying, here's my pixel density and stuff. So servers could choose better images. And again, you can see the support for that. If you look at, can I use, um, I'm not using that yet. I'm just using responsive images. So again, why do I wanna do JPEG? Uh, because I can use compression. So every time I tell my designers this, they kind of freak out, but I say, you can trade off JPEG size versus quality. And I've found you can often cut your size by 50% or more without any visual impact. And so they usually don't believe me, they don't like that. So I say, I tell you what, I make a page. And I say, one of these is the original image. And then I compressed one. And if you can find the original, I'll use it. If you can't tell the difference, I'm going to use the smaller one. So I throw in a few freebies here, right? These are both horrible just to make them feel better that yes, you can go too far. But if you look at the rest of these, even stack side by side, it's pretty hard to tell the original from the ones I've compressed. So it turns out here's the original, it's about 172K. This one here is about 47K. Again, visual quality, very comparable. And any good imaging tool, I use PaintShop Pro, um, people use Photoshop. When you save a JPEG, they have an optimizer that lets you pull up the original and current. And there's literally a slider and you can just move that 
you keep going until you start to see visual artifacts, right? And then you back up and you get to the point where you have a good size. Because again, I'm cutting my image size to about a third of what it was before. That's going to equal a better user experience. Another cool thing with JPEGs is progressive. So I've been doing this for a long time, even back in the modem days. So I'm going to turn on Fiddler and say, please act like a modem. Let's go back and pull up this page. I want you to watch how these images paint. So the one on the left looks like it's done already. Whereas the one on the right, it's painting line by line. This is a progressive JPEG. So again, if you go into Photoshop or PaintShop Pro, you can just say, I want to save it instead of a baseline. 95 plus percent of JPEGs on the internet are this baseline. They paint line by line. Progressive paints fuzzy first and then improves the quality. So if I do that again, so you can see it. From a perceived performance, this one looks done. So we're actually switching our JPEGs on our e-commerce site to be progressive again, because with mobile and slower connection times, we feel that it's going to give the customer the perception that it got downloaded a lot faster. It turns out that the file sizes are about the same, uh, but from a uh, perception as reality, uh, this just looks like it's painted a lot faster. So I'm going to turn that off so we're not slow for the rest of the talk. But that's something else you can do with JPEGs. Another thing to watch out for is metadata. So I'm going to show you another. There's a Fiddler extension called Image Bloat. So I'm going to turn that on. And I'm going to go pull up a web page here. I'm going to hit Control F5 and you'll see these bricks. So what this is representing is this image is 48K, but 7K of it is metadata. So if we go look at what that means, here is my one with metadata. If you go into details, you can see I used a Canon PowerShot G1. Here's my shutter speed. Um, interesting, but uh, my customers don't care, right? This is adding weight to my image that no one's ever going to see. You know, so you can actually strip that metadata out. Uh, so again, I, if you turn that image blow down and just pop around your website, I've seen sites that have 40%, 50% of their images are metadata when they're smaller. Uh, I use a tool called JPEG Tran. It's just a command line tool that will strip that metadata out. So if you own the images, um, if, if you don't check into licensing about whether you're, that would remove copyright and such, but if you own the images, take the metadata out because again, the visual quality will be exactly the same. It's not like when we were compressing and trading visual quality for size, this literally will look exactly the same, but be 15% smaller. So again, that could be an easy win for you. Another thing with images, not all of the images, if I go back to my after page on a desktop view, I'll pull up the one on my own machine here. If you scroll down, all of these images below are not gonna get displayed right away. So I really wanna emphasize that I want the viewport to paint as fast as possible. Don't download anything that might slow people up, okay? So the idea with these images is I can specify, and I'll show you on the slides here. There is native support that just started coming out in Chrome and such, but it's still, again, not everywhere. So I use this plugin I've used for years called Lazy Sizes, and I'm gonna show you how to do that. So if we look at the code, and this was the magic of the data dash. So normally it'd be image source set, with this lazy sizes, I add a class called lazy load and I change it from source set to data dash source set. So if you're familiar with data dash, it's a way to pass data to client side JavaScript and browsers just ignore it. And then if I go to the bottom of my page, I include that lazy sizes min. So what happens now is this image is down below as I start to scroll down the page that lazy sizes will say, hey, this image is about to come into view. 
it'll change the data source set to just source set. And then the browser will wake up and say, oh, I'm gonna pick the best image here and it goes and downloads it. So especially on pages where you scroll and have lots of images down below, uh, it can be a big win again, because you're only gonna download them for people that actually view them. So that is lazy loading. Next thing I'm gonna talk about is deferred loading. So the idea with this is uh, I have a lot of third party things I need to put on my website and I don't want that third party stuff to block my rendering if they're slow. So for instance, I have analytics and other beacons and things I need to put on a web page. I'll warn you, this is code I wrote myself. So use it, uh, test it out, make sure it works for you. But what I've done is I've created my own thing called data deferred source. So what I'm saying here is this third party JavaScript in this case is not important to the page rendering, but I want it to happen eventually. So instead of saying script source equals, I put data deferred source. And then on my body tag, I say, wait until the onload event fire. So basically stuff is painted, <clears throat> onload fired because all of my important stuff is downloaded, then call this load deferred. And in here, I just search for any elements that have data deferred source and change them to source. And any data deferred source set, I change to source set. And you can do other things, iframes, images, whatever. I just wanted to give you a couple examples. So now, if it turned out that my third party JavaScript was slow, it's not gonna impact my page rendering. And so it won't be a single point of failure for my page because I've deferred it to load later. There are some things you can't defer. So if they do document write and things, so you're gonna have to test this out, but it's a good way to say, this stuff is not important, so shove it to be later. Browser vendors also decided they needed a technique similar to this. So they came up with what's called async and defer for JavaScript. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like here. Show you in the browser first. So I have a page. And first I'm gonna show you a, a feature in Fiddler. So I'm gonna clear this. There's a thing called autoresponder. So I've pre-set up my three JavaScript files in here. And I say, I want the first one to take four seconds, second one to take two seconds, and the third one to date. So I can basically add artificial delays to see how that would impact my page. So if I go look at this page, I've got three JavaScript files and some content. So let's see what happens when that JavaScript is slow. So if I go hit that page, you'll see I'm not seeing any content, right? I'm staring at a blank page while these three JavaScripts fire, and then they just each show an alert. Well, if I want to, if it turns out these JavaScript are not important again to the paint, I can just add async. Oops, I lost my quote there. I'm sorry, I did the one in quotes. So if I save this, let's go run that again. I hit Control F5, and the important part you'll notice if I did it right, which I must not have. I could check one thing there. Oops. The important part of using these is my content displays right away while that stuff downloads in the background. And the important thing with async is I'm saying, I don't care what order they fire. So two happen to come first, then three, and then one. It's not quite as good as doing the deferred I showed you. You know, whenever you talk to vendors, they say, oh, put me in the head right at the top and put async and we can't impact your performance. Not really true. All async is saying is download this in the background, but as soon as it's downloaded, start to run it, that running can block other stuff below. So it's not the deferred I showed you earlier, literally pushes it till for sure after onload. But if you can't do this, async is better than nothing. If it turns out that you do care about the order, you can use defer instead. The good thing is if your browsers all the modern browsers support this, but if you run into a browser that doesn't, it's just gonna be 
as slow and bad as it is before. It'll just ignore it. But if you see the contents there right away, now it's gonna still do one, two, and three, but now it does it in order. So that's a cool thing they added into browsers not long ago. Another cool thing they did is called resource hints. So I'm gonna show you a couple of these. So let's say I have a piece of jQuery here I'm gonna download from a CDN that Microsoft has. I can come up in the head here. I'm showing it to you as a meta tag because I'm giving you the code. You can also do this as a HTTP response header, but I can uncomment this one. And what I'm telling it to do is I'm saying, hey, I know eventually when you parse down here, you're gonna see that I need something from ajaxmicrosoft.com. Why don't you start the connection to them way up here? So start doing the DNS lookup, do the connection, negotiate the HTTPS. So that might be done by the time I hit this line, then I can just go get the jQuery. And I've seen people who've used this, they've shown good test cases where that, depending on your site, that can make a huge improvement again because you have a really big page. So I did it for mine and I tested it. Um, the difference between when I pre-connected to where I first used a resource was so close, it didn't help me much. So try it out for yourself because it's easy to add. I can also preload files. So instead of saying just connect to Microsoft, it'll actually start to download this jQuery. And then when I actually reference it here, hopefully it'll be possibly all done or close to done. Another cool one, I don't have a lot of use for this, so I don't do this. If you happen to be on a website where someone visits a page and you're pretty positive, you know where they're gonna go next. So in this example, I'm saying, I'm pretty sure you're gonna go to my default page next. If I set up this pre-render, I'm telling the browser, finish this page first, that's the priority. But when it's done, go in the background, go pull down this other page, all of its CSS, all of its images and JavaScript, and pre-render it. So if the person came to this page, sat for a while, said, oh, I'm gonna click, they click on the link, they go to default.htm, it might just pop immediately. The downloads will all be done and it'll already be rendered. Um, the bad news is if I'm wrong and you're on a mobile phone, I just wasted some of your data, right? Getting a file you never looked at. So I don't use this because I don't have that predictive set of steps across a set of pages. But if you do, um, that again could be a real easy win for you. A couple of miscellaneous things. Um, I'm focusing more these days on critical rendering path. So really focusing on, like I said, lazy loading, smaller images. I really want what's in the main viewport uh, to paint as fast as possible. So I've been looking into uh, inlining CSS. So there are ways to take your CSS files and run tools against them and say, this CSS is important to what's in the viewport and the rest of it isn't. So you can actually take the important stuff and embed it directly into your HTML. So when the parser hits it, it doesn't have to wait for CSS, it already has it. So you can get the main viewport painted and then get the rest of the CSS in the background. Um, I've had mixed luck so far for myself with that. I've seen some sites that uh, works really well for them. I wanted you to know URLs are case sensitive if you didn't know that. So I'm gonna show you an example. I've got a page here that references the exact same image three different ways. This one's all lowercase, that's all lowercase. But if you see this one above here has a capital F, this one has capital F, capital B. Browsers treat those as different. So if you watch all the modern browsers, if I were to go pull this up, I got the same thing there. But if I go look and I have image bloat turned on, so I'm sorry, that's a little hard to read. I'll do that over again. It downloaded three times. So the exact same image, I just wasted 48K, 48K, just because I referenced them wrong. Is it likely I'm gonna do that all on the same page? No, right? But it is very likely, especially with multiple developers, if I like title casing, like I think that looks nice, and that's how I code all my JPEG links, everything we just did about caching and stuff goes out the window because I do it title case, someone else does it lowercase, uh, we're gonna download it twice. So we just made the rule on our site, all of our resources are all lowercase. Um, we did that just because 
we found we were downloading things we didn't need to download just because we didn't realize they were case sensitive. I'm gonna skip over the other two for now and talk about HTTP2. So HTTP2 came out in about 2015. Uh, all the major browsers again support it. There's a lot of things they did to improve it, but the main thing I wanna focus on is what I talked about in the old days, HTTP 1.1, the spec was written to say you could open up browsers could use two connections per host. So they did that for a while and then browser vendors thought and said, well, if I opened up six connections, I would get triple downloaded in parallel. So most of the browsers use six connections per host in the HTTP 1.1 days, but that's still limited to, you can only do six things at a time. When those finish, you could do the next six. HTTP 2 said, you know, every connection you create with TCP, it takes a while to set up. It starts slow. Um, let's just have one single connection and download everything in parallel. So I'm gonna show you, I gotta shut down Fiddler here because it does not currently support HTTP 2. I'm going to show you a demo that I like and hate at the same time. So the first version here is using HTTP and you'll see it takes about 6.6 .6 seconds. So it suggests, why don't you try HTTPS? And you think, well, that's weird. That's going to be encrypted. I don't expect that to be faster. But if you look, it's 57% faster. Well, why is that? Well, it turns out that if you use HTTPS, you can use HTTP2. And when you used HTTP2, it didn't. It could download these things in parallel rather than six at a time. So the that's the good part, <clears throat> and it's true. I mean, we've turned it on on our CDN. That's improved our speed. Um, my I don't have a web page that has 360 check marks, right? So it's a little unrealistic. But I do have pages that have 50 images on them or 50 images, JavaScript, and CSS files. So the more files you have per host and the slower connection and worse latency you have, the better HTTP2 will perform for you. And again, it's usually pretty simple to turn on. For us on our CDN, we just said we want HTTP2. If the browser doesn't support it, it'll use HTTP 1.1. So it's really easy to take advantage of. Once you do that, however, uh, there are things I've been teaching people for years about performance that you should probably stop doing. So the one I mentioned was I bundle all my JavaScript files into one JavaScript file, and I bundled all my CSS files into a single CSS file only because I wanted to, in the HTTP 1.1 days, lower the number of requests I needed to make. And like I said, it made my, that minification made my homepage uh, 46 percent faster so that was great now with http2 uh, there's been a lot of research you can look for yourself um, if you bundled before into a single file they're not saying maybe go all back to not bundling anything uh, but you might want to bundle by areas like maybe my checkout uses certain javascript files or there might be some things that still make sense to combine but don't bundle solely to reduce the number of requests because in HTTP2, that penalty doesn't exist for the multiple requests, if that makes sense. Same thing with CSS sprites. We used to take little small images and shove them into one big image and then use CSS to kind of pull out parts. That doesn't help. Domain sharding was another one we had. I showed you cdn.example.com earlier today. People would cheat and say, well, I'm gonna make a CDN2 dot example.com that'll give me six more connections so they kept doing that and there's a point at which that doesn't help you anymore but people could typically create two or three extra host names and get more parallel downloads again it's just a trick that you don't need to do with http2 anymore and some people were inlining so you can take small images base64 and code them and put them directly into your page. That's a data URI. If you were doing that solely to get the number of requests down, you probably don't want to do that anymore. Same with CSS and JavaScript. If you were inlining it into the page solely to reduce requests, probably not a good thing to do with HTTP2. I put the note, if you're inlining critical CSS, 
that can still make sense, like we talked about for rendering purposes. Couple quick tools, I'm gonna to just jump down to Lighthouse here. If I pull up my before version of the site, you can hit F12. There are built-in auditing tools. Yeah, I happen to use Edge, so I'm gonna do a performance mobile. It's gonna do a performance review of that page, and it's gonna give me a score and then give me hints. So you can see I score a 57. If I jump into the calculator, it shows me those metrics we talked about before. It shows me like my largest contentful paint was really slow. So I scored poorly on something that's a big contributor. If I go run the same thing, I'm just gonna clear that and do the after. And I will cross my fingers here, see if I'm gonna be lucky today. Sweet. So I went from a 57 to 100 just by using those techniques we talked about. <clears throat> so again, Lighthouse scores are part of the core web vitals and such that Chrome is gonna use to help you with ranking. So besides the scores, I like to show those when I do before and after performance techniques. I'm gonna go back to the before. The other interesting thing about this is it tells you hints about things that you should be doing. And when we run this and look at the before, you'll see things that I've called out throughout the talk. So if you haven't done a lot of perf stuff and can't remember each individual one, if you scroll down, you can see it's telling me you have big images, you need to compress those. Um, you could take out unused JavaScript, unused CSS, you could minify your CSS. I think somewhere down here, it talks about good things. Often it will tell me you should be using HTTP2. And so, they have nice links too. So you can come down here and say, well, I don't know exactly how to minify. What does that mean? And I could go read more about what minification is and some of the tools. And so it's just a nice way to spot check where you're at, look at some of the major things you might wanna fix and go get more help on how to do that. So that is Lighthouse. We talked about Fiddler. I use it all the time with autoresponder to intentionally make things slow. Like you can network throttle in dev tools. So you can say act like your 2G, but that's everything on a page. I, I like using the auto responder to say, hey, look, what if this individual CSS file was slow? What does that do to my paint experience? What could I do differently then? Knowing that that might be slow, that's where inlining might help. You know, if I inline the important stuff, it'll paint right away. It won't matter if the rest is slow. Uh, that's something cool you can do with auto responder. I am a Pluralsight author. It turns out that Pluralsight is free for the month of April. So something weird, it's gonna make you watch all my nine courses first. I, I, no, it won't. You can go watch whatever you want. But I do have a full longer web performance course. I have one on uh, guide to images. Both of these go into how do you do JPEG compression? How do you use PaintShop Pro to do that? If you wanna see that. My most recent debugging your website with Fiddler and Chrome DevTools. So something on your site doesn't work. It'll walk you through like maybe your style sheets are bad, which tool is appropriate, and how do you fix your style problem using Chrome DevTools. And then I again have a talk on Fiddler. I've also got cryptography and a few others, but again, it's free for the month of April if you wanna take advantage of that. Again, that is my Twitter, that is my email, that's my blog. Here's a link to the slides uh, and the code. So you'll have the before and after versions of the website. Um, and we have time, I think, to do some quick questions if people have any questions they wanna review. So far, nobody has asked a question because they were attentive to what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot to take in. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of stuff for a, a one hour talk. The good news is hopefully we have it recorded. Uh, you can do that. You can look at the Pluralsight course as well for some of the details. Um, but if you caught some of those techniques and can go check out your site using Web Page Test or Fiddler and identify places where I helped somebody last week. I said, let's just look at your site. We pull it up and they said, well, I think it's pretty fast. And they had an image on the homepage that was 3.8 meg. So that image alone was 3.8 meg. We saved it to a JPEG that was about 190K. That's gonna make a huge difference, right? Um, so knowing what the tools are and stuff is helpful. So I don't know if people, 
want to chat or unmute if you have anything now. Otherwise, like I said, feel free to reach out to me on any of these. Follow me on Twitter or send me an email if you do have questions you think about when you go through the code. Does anybody have a question? You can unmute anytime if you want. Just fire a question. Yeah, I see a question that popped up. I see all these tips very doable. What I don't get is why it is not being followed to speed up CMS packages like WordPress and other plugins that slow user browsing. That's a great question. I mean, especially if you're WordPress, you could make some of these changes that would impact so many customers and so many users. I mean, you really have a platform there where tweaking something correctly can have a huge impact. The other one I didn't mention, I should have mentioned, we just turned on TLS 1.3, which is the newer support for HTTPS. We cut our uh, homepage by 17%. So literally just click a config and say, I wanna use TLS 1.3. TLS 1.3 does better connection setup. It goes back and forth one less time. So things like that. Yeah, I, I hope that maybe if we're lucky, someone from WordPress is on the talk tonight and picks up two or three things because they, they really, they and other sites that get a lot of traffic uh, making these kind of changes just impact even that many more customers, so. Yes, we will share the recording as soon as we do some basic editing to it. And I think it will take probably two to three days before it's available. And I'll make it available as a comment to this particular topic on meetup.com. I'm curious, Robert, uh, are there any like uh, CMSs or even like, like the ASP.NET platform where they try to build in built in all these optimizations right into the product. So we don't have to think about it too much. I'm not familiar with um, a lot of CMS products and whether they built that in. ASP.NET does a good job with their prod, um, their basic templates now setting up compression. IIS has gotten better over the years where it never compressed at the beginning. Now they have compression for static stuff on by default. So I think, each group and each framework is getting better about applying that stuff, but you and, and I as developers are the ones that are putting image tags in, right? And we're the ones deciding we wanna use big JavaScript frameworks or, um, you know, I love Bootstrap and, but it has this CSS, a, a decent amount of CSS. So there's things that frameworks and such can help us with. And then there's most of what we're doing day to day where, uh, the things make a difference. So the one that I like is like the images, right? It takes two minutes for me to open a JPEG in PaintShop Pro, pull up a slider, <clears throat> adjust it, find the point, make it 70% smaller. Now, everybody who comes to my homepage for the rest of the time I have that image, it's going to be faster, save their data plan, save me bandwidth, save me server load, all of that stuff just by knowing I need to do it and investing that little bit of time. But yeah, I mean, it'd be nice. Uh, some of them are do better jobs than others, but most of the stuff we're doing is stuff that we're doing the CSS and JavaScript ourselves and, and need to deal with some of that, so. Yeah, 